Well, we have only two more chapters left in our visit to Persia. And I'd like to have Baha'u'llah's chapter, the very last. So if you'll skip with me to page 65, we'll have chapter 29, God's Cause Today. This is a sort of review, a review of all the wonderful things we've heard. And when we think back over all the terrible things that happened after Ahmad started out to tell the people about the Promised One, Sheikh Ahmed and Said Qazim, remember the beginning of it? We wonder how God's cause could have lived for us to hear about it today. In some parts of the world, they had learned most about Jesus. In other parts of the world, about Muhammad. In others, about Moses. In others, about Krishna. In others, about Buddha and Zoroaster and so on. Now, because of all the brave men and women who gave their lives to tell about the new teachers, all over the world, people are coming to know about the Bab and His Holiness Baha'u'llah. And suppose we think about some of these brave martyrs, these dawn breakers, these heroes and heroines we've heard about. Remember first Sheikh Ahmed, who was the very first one to know that it was time for the Promised One. And then there was his friend, Sayyid Qazim. You remember how he saw the Bab and was invited to his home? Both of these great men told many people about the Bab. And it was as if they had plowed the ground so that the seeds could be planted and the cause of God begin to grow. Then after Sheikh Ahmed and Said Qazim died, Kurdus and Mullah Hussein carried on their work. And you remember the terrible things that happened at Fort Sheikh Dabarsi, and how Kurdus and Mullah Hussein both became martyrs, and how they died for the cause of God. And then there was Bahid and Hujjat, who were forced to fight so hard in order to save their lives long enough to tell the story of the Promised One. And at last, they too were martyred. And then even the precious Bob himself was slain by those cruel and wicked people who wouldn't listen to his beautiful message. And when he died, his enemies thought surely they would never hear that message again. But we know what happened. His Holiness Baha'u'llah was left. And all of those who had heard and believed in the Bob's message now turned to Baha'u'llah. And then you remember the tragic thing which happened. A young man who tried to kill the Shah, they blamed all the followers of the Bab, even Baha'u'llah. Tahereh, the brave woman who helped the Persian women so much, and who taught about the Promised One, she too was a martyr and was put to death. All the letters of the living were either killed or put in prison or sent out of the country. And how many, many others died, even women and children. Then, as if that were not enough, at last His Holiness Baha'u'llah Himself was banished and sent out of the country where He had been born and where He had always lived. He and His family had to cross the mountains in the middle of a cold winter and make their home in a country called Iraq. And from there they went to Palestine, which is now called the Holy Land, because so many of these divine teachers had lived there. Well, it's no wonder that the Shah believed that he would never hear about the Bab or Baha'u'llah again or their message. They seemed to feel like that the wings of death were hovering over this great cause and it would vanish. But how mistaken, how foolish he was. For there is something in the cause of God that will not allow it to die. It grows and grows and prospers from year to year. And they tell us that at night the very darkest time is just before the dawn. That is, just before the daylight comes. And that's the way it was with the cause of God. Its enemies believed that it had entirely disappeared and they'd never hear of it again. But that was just the time it was starting to grow stronger and stronger. The Shah didn't know that because he... He, he didn't understand that because he was so great and powerful. But he was only a tool which God used to start the cause in another country. In that country, His Holiness Baha'u'llah was given much more freedom to spread his message. And now it is spread all over the world. Those who are part of it are no longer called Babis. The Babis were the followers of the Bab. They are now called Baha'is, followers of Baha' or Baha'u'llah. 
in every part of the world. And books of the Bab and Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha, Baha'u'llah's son, are printed in many languages. I'm sure you've read some of them yourself. So all people in all the lands all over the whole world can read these wonderful stories. You see, the cause of God is like a tree. At first, when Sheikh Ahmed started out to teach about the Promised One, it was like planting a little seed. This seed grew until it became a plant, and then it became like a tree, and then it had blossoms on it, and then fruit, and the people could eat of the fruit and be nourished. That's the way it is with the religion of God. Abdul Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah, brought the great news about the Bab and Baha'u'llah to our country here, to America, and to England and other countries in Europe. And he went to Africa. Do you remember the story of Abdul Baha when he was a little boy and the other boys weren't kind to him? That was while his father, Baha'u'llah, was in prison. And now His Holiness Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha have both gone on to that beautiful land to which we shall go when our work in this world is done too. But all the time the cause of God, the Baha'i faith, is growing. And someday everyone in the whole world will know about it because of those who gave their lives and were happiest in telling the good news to everyone else. Perhaps someday, even though you're very small yet, someday you'll be one of those teachers who'll travel to other countries, far off lands, and tell the people about Baha'u'llah and the new day. Because pioneering and teaching, the beloved guardian said, is the single most important service any Baha'i can render during any great plan. And we do not know yet what great things these teachers will do in the future. Maybe you'll be one of them. Of course, at the time when the Bab and His Holiness Baha'u'llah lived on earth, there was much fighting and killing. But in the new day, which is just beginning now, Baha'u'llah tells us that eventually there will be no more wars. There will be peace because of this great truth. Won't it be a beautiful world when everyone is kind and thoughtful of others and will never want to hurt anyone? Well, we can begin that kind of a world right now ourselves at least, can't we? Just as the Bob began when he was a little boy. And then God will help us as he helped those others who first left their homes to tell the people of the world about the Promised One. And all of this came about because of the heroes and heroines you've heard about in these stories. Especially the Bob and Baha'u'llah, the two wonderful messengers of God. So I think we should end not here, but with the story of Baha'u'llah, the one for whom the Bab gave his life, sacrificed his life, and the one whom the Bab loved so much. Because you see, the hour is near when Baha'u'llah would announce to the world that he was the supreme redeemer of men, the promised one of all ages. And so, our next time together, we're going to talk about Baha'u'llah as we make this journey to Persia Iran, the cradle of the faith. And of course, that will be our last time together. And so, my little friends, my fellow workers in the cause of God, we've come to the last chapter in our story of the spiritual conquest of the planet. This is chapter 30, and it is called Baha'u'llah, the glory of God, for that's what his name means. And all the holy books said that the day would come when the great world teacher would appear, and the world would be a better place for all of us to live in because of him. These holy books also said that the enemies would try to prevent people from accepting the promised one. And we've certainly seen that was true, haven't we? And that they would have eyes to see, but they wouldn't see. And they'd have ears to hear, but they wouldn't hear. And that's exactly what happened. After the death of the Bob and so many of his brave followers, the wicked leaders and their friends believed that they'd have no more trouble with the Bobbies. They were called Bobbies because they were followers of the Bob. I told you that earlier. And they were scattered all over the country now. And of course they were feeling very sad and discouraged at the terrible things that had happened. And when they heard the news that the Bob had been martyred in Tabriz. 
But though one great leader had been taken away, another was yet to come. That was God's promise to us, wasn't it? The Bob had been telling his followers that very thing for a long time. He said he had come to prepare the way for the second divine teacher whom God was sending. And the Bob called him His Holiness. The Bob said that all of his own glory came from the one who was yet to appear. And that it would happen, he said, in nine years. Isn't that wonderful? The Bob said that he had sacrificed himself wholly for this one who was yet to come. That he longed for martyrdom in his path. Such was the love between the Bab and Baha'u'llah that Nabil, the Persian historian, has written that if all the branches of every tree were turned into pens, and all the seas were ink, and earth and heaven rolled in one great parchment, one big piece of paper, it still wouldn't be possible to tell about the love the Bab had for Baha'u'llah and Baha'u'llah for the Bab. And this is the love that they shower on us. Isn't that beautiful? The Bab prepared the way so every one of us would understand and accept Baha'u'llah. And you can see it was necessary to prepare the way because at first people are never ready for a great change. They want to stay in the old ways, the ways they've always known. They don't want to change. And that's the reason that so many of them didn't want to listen to the Bab. They thought that Muhammad and the Quran were enough for them. But by the time the message about one new teacher has been spread all over the country, the path of the second is made easier. So the Bab made it easier for the appearance of Baha'u'llah. And then it was possible to send his message all over the whole world. So after the Bab had been martyred, his followers who were left were not alone. His Holiness Baha'u'llah gathered them together and gave them courage to carry on the teachings of the new day. Of course, you know that sometimes people are very foolish, and they do things without stopping to think what will happen afterward. And that was the trouble with the two young men who lived in Baha'u'llah's country. They tried to kill the king because so many of their friends had been put to death. They didn't succeed in killing him, but because of their thoughtless act, terrible things happened. These young men were Bobbies, and all of the Bobbies were blamed. And the people were very much excited and many who had nothing whatsoever to do with what had happened were made to suffer. Even His Holiness Baha'u'llah, the Supreme Redeemer of men, was blamed because he was now the leader of the followers of the Bab, and he was treated with the greatest cruelty, and at last he was shut up in a dark underground dungeon, and his neck and feet were bound with heavy chains, and for days he was given neither food nor drink. And at that time, the most great branch was a little boy, eight years old. The most great branch, you know, was Abdul Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah. And he and the rest of the family were living with an uncle while his father, Baha'u'llah, was in that underground prison. And whenever the little boy was sent out into the street, other boys of his age would run after him and pelt him with stones. One day he was going from the market alone when he looked back and saw a crowd of boys running after him with sticks and stones. And the only way he could save himself was to show that he was not afraid of them. So Abdu'l-Bah turned around and began toward running toward a crowd of them with such a brave and determined air that they turned and ran away. Sounds like Fort Sheikh to Barsi and Ali Mardin Khan and Fort Khadja, doesn't it? And I'll tell you one thing, they never bothered Abdu'l-Bah again. When Baha'u'llah was put in prison, many of his followers were taken also. And in spite of the way they suffered from the terrible place where they were imprisoned, they were very joyous because Baha'u'llah was with them. They even sang there in the darkness of that prison. Baha'u'llah chanted with them. He taught them a chant. They were in chains. One side would sing a chant and the other side would answer. And the noise of their love and songs would come rising out of that dark prison. And this happened all because of one of the young men tried to kill the Shah, finally confessed that he had done it. And so Baha'u'llah was freed. They found that he was blameless. All through his life, however, Baha'u'llah carried on his body the marks of that terrible time in that dungeon prison and the heavy chains that scarred him. Well, the punishment of the Babis was now stopped by an order of the Shah. But as soon as Baha'u'llah was out of prison... 
he was handed another order from the king, saying that he and his family must leave Persia at once. A Russian soldier who was in Tehran invited Baha'u'llah to go to Russia to live, where he would be safe, but Baha'u'llah refused, for that, he said, was not God's wish. And so, one day, with a member of the Shah's bodyguard and a Russian officer, Baha'u'llah and his family left the country where he had been born and where they had always lived, the cradle of the faith, and they set out for Iraq, over the mountains, exiled to Baghdad. And again, the leaders thought that was going to be the end of Baha'u'llah and his faith. But you know, the most wonderful thing happened. The most wonderful thing about all of this is that though the king of Persia and the king of Turkey, who were the enemies of the faith, thought they were banishing Baha'u'llah to a place where he and his faith would never be heard of again, the truth is they were carrying out the work of God. They sent Baha'u'llah, the glory of God, to Iraq to almost the exact spot where the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel had his vision about the glory of God who would come to the Holy Land by way of the gate from that place. And you know the Bob's name means the gate and Baha'u'llah means the glory of God. You've learned that in these thrilling stories. Baha'u'llah went from Baghdad to Constantinople to Adrianople and to the Holy Land where the world center of our faith is. And every step of the way he, Baha'u'llah, fulfill prophecy after prophecy. It was like a thunder shower. There were so many. I tried to write a book about these prophecies called Thief in the Night, 283 pages long, and it doesn't begin to cover all the prophecies fulfilled by Baha'u'llah, the return of Christ, the one promised in all the holy books, the Lord of the vineyard, the great shepherd who came to bring about the day promised by Jesus and the messengers of the past, the wonderful day of the one fold and one shepherd. Did you know that the Baha'i centers all over the world are even called the sacred fold of God? What a marvelous story. And so, my little sheep, my fellow sheep of the great shepherd Baha'u'llah, that's the end of our story in our book. The music of Baha'u'llah's teachings can now be heard on all sides, moving, exciting, stirring the world. I hope someday we can read another book together soon. But of course, you'll all be grown up soon and you'll be out teaching all over the world. Maybe we can meet at your pioneering post someday. Please remember your old friend Bill Sears in your sweet and precious prayers. And since we've been visiting Persia, cradle of our faith, land of Baha'u'llah, I think we should say farewell in the language of the Blessed Beauty, Kuda Hafez which means goodbye, all you future heroes and heroines of God. Chudah Hafez. Goodbye.